Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Chancellor Linda Katehi and Harold Schmidt. Well, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. So what we really wanted to do is to talk uh, about this Innovation Institute, give um, a little bit of perspective of how we started in our thinking and um, where it is going from now. Uh, of course, it's uh, evolving to be something even more exciting than we thought it would be in the beginning. But I just wanted to uh, um, say how we started. UC Davis and Mars have worked together for over 40 years. And it has started with um, individual faculty and Mars researchers who worked together on very specific projects. And in the last so many years really has been expanded to be many um, UC Davis faculty and researchers who work with many Mars um, researchers and scientists. And as we looked forward, both uh, Harold and I asked the question of whether it really makes sense to continue the same way as we've done in the last 40 years or whether we have an opportunity to do something different, unique, and uh, not just more exciting to all of us, but also of greater impact to our communities, but the rest of the world in terms of addressing the major challenges that we have in food and health. And uh, um, you saw a little bit from the video about how uh, some of our colleagues, faculty, and uh, uh, researchers in general will um, have, have been thinking about, of course, approaching food as a system and the issues that um, we will all have to address. So the one thing, at least, that um, as I was thinking about this opportunity to develop something new, one of the things that becomes clear is that food and health are huge social systems. Um, they are not just having a number of science or presenting a number of science challenges, but they are presenting a condition for populations. And it's not just about making scientific discoveries, but improving the human condition for these populations. And of course, that improvement will come through appropriate nutrition, through making food available, and through um, providing the diets that are needed to improve really the uh, health condition and the wellness of these populations. So it's a huge system. And then, as such, really needs the participation of uh, scholars and scientists from across the spectrum. And as you heard in the morning from Elizabeth Blackburn, um, in asking the question on how to improve human health and how to extend uh, human life, the aspects and the, well, the questions that we are generating, of course, are far bigger than just um, biology or what happens with cells, far bigger in terms of food, of how you produce food and how you consume it. It is about the people who will eventually do that and how can new discoveries eventually help them change behavior and how that meshes well with their culture and their traditions. And so it, it, the exciting thing is that it brings together every discipline. It does require a truly transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach to solving the problem. And beyond that, uh, when we talk about having more impact in improving quality of life, it makes it obvious to us that it's not just science breakthroughs that we need to support and encourage, but we also need to take the path from the time a breakthrough has been made to creating a product or service that can really impact people. And it's that path that I believe Harold will focus on that we have seen that needs attention. It's what happens after the discovery has been made. And how do you support people coming together to take the next steps that are needed?
to take, uh, so we translate a particular discovery or many of them as a matter of fact sometimes to something that is useful. And we hope that this Innovation Institute will focus on this particular path. And we hope that it's going to be inclusive and welcoming, not just uh, UC Davis faculty and researchers or Mars scientists and researchers, but uh, scientists and researchers and innovators who can come from all places, from all organizations to work together with us and our uh, colleagues and produce things that will fundamentally improve quality of life. So that's how I saw it. And of course, that activity has kept me very excited because it is something that we can do. And in the process, we'll change our organizations for the better as well. So, Thank, Thanks, Linda. So the comments I make, I'm, I'm sure, will in part overlap with what, what Linda just said, and that will reflect, I think, the resonance and, uh, and sort of shared purpose that has come out of these many years of discussion. The, uh, I think Linda set it up correctly um, in that Mars and UC Davis have had a really fantastic um, relationship during the last 40 years from a research perspective. And, and uh, it could be said that the first 20 years of the relationship were more tactical, and then uh, during the last 20 years, the relationship has become more strategic, but it's always been really rooted in, um, in, in uh, research. So uh, Pamela Mars, who you all met on the stage here uh, earlier today, I, I can recall sitting in uh, meetings where I might be presenting to the technology committee that she now chairs, and, and she, would, she would ask questions like, great on the research side, how's the translation going? And, um, and that's a really important question. And so I think a first fundamental with this relationship that Linda and I are describing is that this it is a research-based relationship, but, it's, but the research part is an element of the overarching relationship we're going to take forward, which is going to be an innovation-based agreement and relationship. And those innovation is often an overused term, um, but it is important to understand it in this context that we're talking about. Um, research uh, and scientific discovery and invention does not equal innovation. Um, oftentimes that is confused, and it can be quite destructive because because one can say, well, with a great discovery, then the innovation has happened. And actually, that's not the case. As, as uh, Edmund Phelps, would, uh, a 2006, I believe, Nobel laureate in economics, would describe in his book, an innovation is when you actually bring a new method or practice into the market and, and have an impact at a social level. And, um, and so research and invention and scientific discovery are critical inputs to the innovation cycle, but then there are all kinds of other, other factors that play in, whether that's understanding of regulatory policy, uh, understanding how best to co educate and communicate users and consumers, uh, figuring out how to apply really good management teams in order to uh, put discoveries into business ventures, et cetera. The, the, the innovation cycle is complex and large. And so um, where this really came from for us, and it goes back to the comment that I mentioned that Pamela would, or the question she, she tends to ask us, which is where's the translation piece? And as a privately held um, company, as you heard her describe, we do have a time horizon, it turns out, that I think matches that which is more like the university. And as we've gone through these discussions, I would say the single thing that has really struck home with me that makes this such you know, a right thing to do and a good thing to do and also a doable thing to do. So first off, it turns out this really probably hasn't been done before, quite this innovation-based relationship between a land-grant university and, and, a, and a large food company in this, in this innovation-based way. And, and what enables it is that the Mars family is very interested in understanding what are the barriers to having a sustainable business model 
long into the future, not measured in quarters, as they might do on Wall Street, not measured in years, but really measured in decades. And when one articulates the challenges, or the grand challenges, as we like to call them, which are the barriers to our business model being sustainable, they overlap significantly with the mission of the University of California, which is to serve society. And some of those challenges would include things like sustainable agriculture supply chains that, that, that uh, enable us to have commodities to convert into products. It could include finding, and does include, finding sustainable sources of protein for our, uh, for our pet food manufacturing operations, for example. So these are the types of grand challenges that are important to Mars in a very selfish way, but also important to the University of California and also important to society overall. Um, I'll close my comments by saying, I think what is also new and novel about what we want to do is one can, can scan the internet or scan your colleagues um, who, who have participated in industry academic relationships before and you will find many of them. There are many relationships out there. And um, th this one differs from that in that it is meant to be specifically an innovation-based relationship, number one. Number two, it is meant to be directed towards these grand challenges that are important both to our business sustainability as well as to society in general. And number three is that this is explicitly meant not to be a relationship between UC Davis and Mars. This is explicitly meant to be a relationship that is open to all, um, whether it be other companies who would be our competitors, whether it's government organizations, whether it's universe, other universities or other non-government groups. The, the way to create an innovation ecosystem that can actually create new ways of innovation that can solve these grand challenges is going to come from creating a vibrant ecosystem that includes all. And, and, and I can validate that from a Mars perspective by approximately quoting uh, Forrest Mars Sr., who in 1947 wrote a memo to all the employees of Mars Incorporated and noted that the sole purpose of the company was to deliver a mutuality of benefits to all stakeholders. That included consumers, that included uh, farmers who supplied raw materials that we used, it included government organizations, it included our competitors, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's really the spirit that we see this relationship taking. And um, I also wanted to say, as I mentioned in the morning, one more thing, that this is something relatively new for um, a, as a model of collaboration between a university and a company. And we are trying to break a number of barriers that um, are naturally uh, in place because of the way our organizations have been developed. And uh, we have done a lot of work on both sides to really create the environment that would allow this innovation to happen and to allow it to happen without any uh, constraints in terms of the ability of the team of individuals who come together to do their best work. So um, it's something that we, of course, will do and learn from it. Um, the, the first few um, teams that will be funded to uh, pursue their specific ideas will help us also uh, find better ways, I guess, mm -hmm. to uh, help them. And so the next uh, two or three years will be a learning process for us, will provide us with a lot of feedback. But we really believe that in the long term, this is going to create a new way of um, creating um, new things, not just ideas, but uh, new products and services and, and do it effectively and do it in an accelerated way. So much for your comments. I'd like to invite the audience in about brocade on both aisles. There's a microphone, and if there's anyone who would like to ask a question of the Chancellor or of Professor Schmitz, or would like to make a comment, I'd appreciate it if you would step up to the mic. I know that so many people in the audience have been involved in various capacities, either as scientists, as collaborators from Mars over the, over the many years, and so many of you have very close knowledge of what's going on today. 
Of course, there are other opportunities as we go forward for discussion. And here's a brave soul. <laughs> it seems to be my fate to always ask the first question. Um, I'm Irena Asmussen. I have grew up in Davis. Uh, I moved back to Davis recently. I now work for the state government. I just wanted to say this is exactly the sort of thing that I've long thought Davis should be doing. I've traveled all over the world. People know about Davis. People really know about the research that Davis does in agriculture. It's made a huge difference to so many people. So I'm really happy that you know, you're pushing the bounds of collaboration, you're pushing the bounds of innovation, and keep up the good work. Thank I look you. forward to it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your comment. I'll go to the mic on the right. Hello, my name is Mary Ann Ryan. I'm specifically addressing this to the chancellor. Possibly I should have waited until the end of the day because I haven't heard everything yet. But so far today, I have not heard one word about artists being included. And I think their opinions are well understood to be quite different than the way scientists think. I would like to ask that there be attention given to including artists in this entire project. Absolutely. In fact, I wanted to say something about that. Uh, thank you for your comment, and you are absolutely right on. When we talk about food specifically and um, trying to understand the cultures and the history and the traditions of communities to be able to help the communities with um, through food um, to achieve a better quality of life. Art is the way of um, helping communities take action. It's the way to speak to communities and help people who are not experts in science or in specific areas to really become curious and interested in um, developing new approaches in diet, in making better choices. Art is what is helping us communicate. And uh, artists are very creative, of course, in um, developing those ways of communication that scientists will not be able to, or anybody else. So in these teams, we expect to see, and in fact, artists are great innovators. I have to tell you this much. We have um, startup companies, especially in, um, in the digital space, where we had computer scientists and artists who came together to create new products. So artists have already participated very extensively in innovation, but they will be absolutely important in um, the teams that we'll try to put together. Now, I'd love to actually also respond to that because I think it's a fantastic provocation. And um, so two quick comments. One is that um, one of the projects which was not illustrated in the video but actually was quite important in many ways to Mars was a project that Lou Gravetti, who's a professor emeritus here at Davis, and Howard Shapiro, who you'll short, shortly hear from, they led a 10-year project that investigated uh, the, the full understanding of the history of cacao, both from a pre-Columbian perspective as well as then post-contact in, in the colonial and, and uh, you know, fledgling United States period. And of course, that, that required literally a team of over 60 linguists and artists, et cetera, to understand what these artifacts were, what they meant to food culture, and that actually translated then to the molecular level of understanding the sort of chemical residues that were in artifacts that were found in Central America, et cetera, et cetera. It was quite a, it was very eye-opening for Mars. It was a great project that also opened our eyes to new product possibilities, innovation, et cetera. So that's one project that I think um, already sort of fits, you know, we've learned and it fits with what you're saying. The second comment I'll make is actually the reason we are here today at this place is because of an art exhibit that's in the Mondavi Center right now, which is of course the Nobel Laureate, the Sketches of Science exhibit. And I really encourage you to, to take a look through that exhibit. During the opening ceremony, Volker um, Steger, the, the, photograph, or the photographer stroke artist, he has done a magnificent job of doing just what Linda said, which is capturing from an artistic perspective and, and multi-dimensional perspective 
these laureates and their science and then their own works of art and these sketches so that, that, that it's more easy for, as, as viewers of the exhibit, to understand these people as human beings and also understand their scientific discoveries through their art. And I think that's a great comment and, and we, we, we need to do more of this sort of thing. You. There, there's an amazing similarity, <clears throat> pardon me, in the draw sketches of the scientists compared to sketches that artists do for their project. One thing I <clears throat> wanted to say, I've had the privilege since, since uh, 2006 to work with the high energy physicist from CERN. Mm -hmm. I've spent about a month there and I've gone twice and have done work on the high energy uh, particle physics project. And through that, I was able to fully understand the interaction between mm -hmm. physicist and artist. And it was really astonishing what each of us did not know about what the other was thinking. I th Thank I th you th so I th much yeah. for your Thank time. You. Absolutely, and I think what you, if I, I can't resist saying this because you've illustrated it, art and design are critical parts of the innovation cycle, which is exactly why we want to have an innovation-based relationship rather than just a research-based relationship. So I think your comments have provoked that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. We have two more, and we'll go to this microphone next. Uh, thank you. My name is Judy Morris. I work with Cool Davis, an organization that helps the city of Davis to reduce its carbon footprint. And I fully appreciate that Mars is already concerned about climate change and all that implies. So I would like to suggest that perhaps we could take a leaf out of so to, so to speak, out of the book of some of the Native American tribes that whenever they have projects or are working on problems, someone is always appointed to only have responsibility for representing the viewpoint of the planet of nature. Mm. So it's not... a um, a mixed message of someone, oh, I need to remember that while I work on the project, but there's somebody there to actually take on that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to respond? It's a great point, and I, I can envision, I'm sure, I don't want to speak for you, Linda, but I imagine you were envisioning the same thing with, you know, as we assemble these teams to go after various you know, projects and programs, I could see in an advisory function or, or whatever it might be, but someone like, like you just mentioned always being present. That should become part of our operating system almost. Thank you. We'll go to the mic on the right. My name is Gabriela Ali from the Center for Biophotonics at UC Davis. It was great to hear that you're inviting other companies to join the uh, Innovation Institute. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, what the mechanics would be. So um, I have to tell you that we don't have all the details worked out, but we have uh, a number of our faculty who have already started their fundamental work in collaboration with other companies. And we will um, invite them as well to come and participate. And of course, since they will come to participate in, in innovating with others, but having an IP that was produced through another company, that that makes it natural for us to really invite these um, other companies to, if they want, participate as equal members. So we are going to be working on that. Um, the impact, the, the World Food Center that is really also engaged in this effort because they are uh, uh, Innovation Institute for Food and Health will be under the auspices of the World Food Center, will help us in making that out, outreach to other uh, companies for participation. And we do have um, a number of organizations that have already shown interest. But we are still in the very early stages and, and we have not done that yet, but I hope that, that we will really work quickly on achieving that.